Okay. Okay, we've had the official word, that's the recording started. Um, so today we want to tell you about the Next Generation Embryology Project that is a collaboration. Um, it's led by Jana van Hemert at the National e Science Centre in Edinburgh. And unfortunately, Jana is away at another meeting today. As you all, I'm sure, are aware, are aware, we did have a lot of difficulty in trying to find a uh, date and time to gather everybody together. Um, but Jano, unfortunately, is not here. But um, Richard Baldock, who you has already waved to us, is um, the PR from the uh, MRC Human Genetics Unit. And um, there's myself and Rosa in Newcastle, and Greg also, and Greg Yaikong in um, at the National Science Centre as well. The project is funded by JISC, which is the Joint Informatics System Committee, and that's their um, web address uh, for those who are interested. Um, so just a, a quick view of what are the project aims. Really, we wanted to develop a prototype which would allow us to take the three-dimensional models that we've been working on and developing for a number of years. Uh, and we're going to talk about the human ones, but uh, I'll move on and, uh, later and talk about mouse ones too, and link those three-dimensional models to a prototype repository that had resources for use in um, teaching and learning of embryology. And the one major question is, of why would you want to do this? And the main reason is, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's a huge volume of data um, with all different aspects of, of embryology, both for research and for teaching. And that data is uh, largely image-based. And it's data that, in order to make sense of it, you need to have a three-dimensional and then, uh, in time, four-dimensional understanding. And that creates very specific kinds of um, difficulties. And one of the very first thing that really we wanted to ask you, particularly those of you who are involved in the teaching of embryology, are what are the difficulties and issues that you see with um, teaching embryology, and what kind of resources have you found uh, that are already available that help? And we're, we're through this session, the, the what would help part of the question is, um, our suggestion or our proposal is that the kind of resource that we're developing with um, the next, next Generation Embryology Project would be one way of trying to address these difficulties. So if I could move to the... Oh, no. So I'm going to insert a blank slide and um, I would, at this point, throw it open to, the, the, uh, to everyone else and say, okay, what kinds of difficulties do you encounter when you are um, trying to, or when you are teaching uh, embryology or carrying out uh, your research? And I'll click off in case anybody wants to speak. So you should feel free to um, write at this point. So say the difficulties you might have are um, that you're uh, Working in a oh, sorry <laughs> that you're working um, with the two D sections uh, or images and trying to relate these to um, three D objects, for example. So I don't know if that's something that. Uh, people feel it's difficult or whether that's, that's something you find. For example, students uh, find it reasonably straightforward to move from sagittal to transverse to coronal images.
thank you to um, I think it was Heather and uh, maybe John as well. So this is also a um, a learning experience in using the whiteboards. But uh, I'm. Embryo. I haven't tried that. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad that there's a consensus that um, 2D and 3, the 2D to 3D move is difficult, and that, as Heather said, that there's uh, it's working with different kinds of students, um, and different aspects of it may be harder or easier for them. But for most students, I think. Uh, the in imaging in their heads, uh, what's happening in 2D to 3D is um, is something that they need help with. That's fortunate because um, if I move on, has everybody finished? Sorry, could I just ask everybody if you're all happy and and uh, are finished making comments? Could you yes put the ticks tick if you or across if you do want to say something else. Okay, I think most people are, are happy for us to move on at this point. So I'll move on to the next slide, um, which explains a little bit about the starting of our starting material. So, as you'd have gathered from um, my, the question about 2D and 3D, really what we're uh, aiming to use are three-dimensional models, and these models are or uh, atlas models, as we're calling them here, are both them and the, uh, the atlas information and the gene expression data are taken prim primarily from two websites that reflect um, that are the, the outward uh, view of two projects. One is the EMAS Atlas project, which is um, uh, directed by Richard, uh, Richard Baldock and also Duncan Davidson, and that's at this uh, web address here. And that's in the MRC Human Genetics Unit in Edinburgh. And now the other is the Hudson website. And Hudson is Human Developmental Studies Network, which is run from Newcastle, but has participants from a number of places, um, including Heather uh, uh, H who's joined us today. So, and on that Hudson uh, website, we have an atlas of the developing human brain, and also a gene expression spatial database with uh, human data from about a um, hundred genes, and Richard has just posted the new um, email status address, which we'll change and, and add on to the. Uh, oh. Okay, so we've we've um, now posted that below, so that that's the the new address. Okay, so when I say three-dimensional models, what is it that, uh, what are they like, what are we using? So this is um, um, a video, uh, which I'll, uh, or a movie, which of a Carnegie Stage 17 human uh, embryo, and the 3D model is generated by a process called optical projection tomography, which was a methodology developed by James Sharp when he was working at the Human Genetics Unit in Edinburgh. Um, and at the bottom of the um, this, this slide, I've put the Sharp reference. And the, um, these 3D models are generated from intact specimens. And this is a volume render. And if I move this to one side and share my which is a green a black group of green okay and do a region and then and that and this is not that <laughs> sorry just the technology here okay this one and this one okay so now you should be okay so I should be sharing um, I hope this 
a movie of those 3D models. You can see now it's spinning around. And so you can see that you have really very nice detail and definition of the, um, uh, of the, the whole embryo surface or, or uh, uh, outer appearance. But these models then we put them into MA Paint, which is software developed by uh, Richard and his colleagues. And what that allows you to do is to section the 3D model. So this is the same three-dimensional model. Um, and you can section it digitally in any plane. And here we're choosing to show the sagittal plane and the transverse plane. And what you can see is when I press this and I click it to start, you'll see it's running through the more or less transverse plane. And you can see the line of digital sectioning moving through on the sagittal section. And then similarly, as you move through the transverse section, let's play that again, um, you can see the uh, corresponding section in the other plane. And basically, you can look at any plane that you want, and you can look at a number of planes uh, simultaneously. And this particular model, and um, all the models that we have on the, the website, we have painted them, um, identifying particular regions in the developing uh, brain. And so uh, the older ones, the Carnegie Stage 22 one, the eight-week model, is painted in the greatest detail. And this one um, is painted uh, so that you can see regions in the developing forebrain, um, forebrain, uh, midbrain, and hindbrain, and then through into the spinal cord. No, tough one. <laughs> <laughs> we want to resolve that. Yes, that one. Okay. So now we should. I should stop sharing the the screen. We should be back to the um, the screen of the the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So that's the the models and the kind of things that we can do with them. And the other side of the prototype is our repository, and. Um, we use DSpace, which is, uh, I think, a very common one, certainly in the UK, I'm not sure about elsewhere. But it's a common repository used by universities, often, for example, to archive the PhD thesis um, of their, the students. So it's a, a common repository used by libraries. Um, and it's within this repository that we uh, are depositing the research and teaching materials. And we're using Creative Commons which is a set of licenses that allow people to say what kind of um, conditions or otherwise they're going to put on the sharing of the material that they generate. And the repository, so the prototype we have um, created is public. So with the link, anybody who has the link can make it available. And the idea would be that into that public repository, uh, other groups could uh, contribute. But equally, if you wanted to generate a repository using DSpace, um, you could generate a private repository for your own teaching materials. Uh, but if it were useful, and this is the question for this webinar, um, if it were useful, that you would then uh, link your teaching materials to the, the three-dimensional space represented by the models, the 3D models. So the whole thing put together, the basis or the idea of it, is that what you're generating is a Google map for developmental biology, so that you have the, um, the full model available. But what's coming uh, over the web is just a very small um, part of the image that people are specifically interested in. And attached to that part of the image is the data uh, that either we have generated or other people have generated or people have uh, deposited that um, indicates interesting features uh, in the area that is being looked at. And I think I'm going to hand over to Rosa now, who's going to, to take you through and give you a, a very short demonstration of the viewer. Okay, thank you, Susan. Right, I'll have to do another uh, application share, so bear with me.
Okay, if you can all see a Firefox web page with the login, can you please press the green tick just so I know you can see this? Okay, great. Gavin, can you see this? Okay, Gavin, I'm going to assume that you can. <laughs> you just haven't pressed the tick. Uh, if not, press the X now. <laughs> just underneath the participant window where your name's listed. Okay. Right, so essentially, um, I'm hoping that all of you have had a chance to use this, but I'm guessing that not everyone will. Uh, if it's a bit slow, um, I'll just pause after each page and hopefully it will catch up for you. So what you would do is the first time you log in, you'd have to press this join button and fill in a brief form that will um, allow you to use it using a username and password. Okay, you should now be on the MBO site. Um, when you log in, you get presented with this seemingly blank page with a menu bar at the top. You have the search function, which you can search for any resources, uh, as brief help uh, pages, which will kind of give you an overview as to how to use it, uh, and about section, which just tells you what this web page is about, and this is your login details here, and you can log out or change your password, etc. on this search. So what you should do is click on the embryo menu, and you'll be presented with a list of embryos. Uh, we've loaded five different embryo models um, from Carnegie Stage 14 to 23, um, but we've mainly concentrated on 16, 17, and 22. So I'll just show you Carnegie Stage 17 briefly. It loads up the 3D model, uh, and you can manipulate it, um, look at any section plane you wish using this click and drag feature on the embryo button, or the embryo model, sorry. Um, or you can also double click in the boxes down below and just type in numbers to jump or use the slider bars to move up and down. Um, we decided it would be easier to preload uh, or pre-save some orientations. So if you go to the orientation menu and press select, you can see that we've already saved some uh, mid-sagittal, mid-transverse and mid-coronal views. I'm going to go into the mid sagittal view. And this shows you all of our layers are put on by default. Essentially, we decided to set up the viewer so that you have a model, uh, and on top of that, you have the orientation. So we preloaded sagittal, uh, transverse, and um, coronal. And then for each of those orientations, we had to save a series of layers onto which you could save resources. So for this one, we have um, several different layers, brain, heart, a kind of quiz where you will name the feature or um, structure, and also developmental overview. So I'm just going to turn off that quiz feature um, so you can see things a bit better. So here, you can either label regions such as the hind brain, or you can put in markers and tag resources to these markers. So if we have a quick look, this is the brain marker. And on here, we've linked resources to do with the Carnegie Stage 17 brain. So if I click on this resource, it's an OPT movie showing the nerves of the head of a CS17 embryo. If I click on this, it takes you to the DSpace repository that Susan mentioned before. Um, this is a public site, so anyone can log on and use this. We have the CC license down here, which tells you what you can use this. Um, this file for whether you can modify it, whether you can use it in teaching, etc. And of course, you can for hours, um, so long as you acknowledge the source and the author. And here, I'm just going to play you the, the nerve MPEG, and it's jumping a little bit on my screen, so hopefully, you can see it. Play it again, see if it's any better. Okay, so that just kind of gives you a little idea of how how things work. And once you've looked at the resources, you can go back, look at another resource, a web page, whatever. Um, and of course, you can add in your own resources yourself. And um, okay, I'll go back to Susan now. Thank you. 
okay, we weren't sure how many people would have had a chance to have a look at the um, the uh, um, portal, the NG embryology portal. So wondered at this point whether um, people wanted to take 10 minutes to to um, look through it themselves. And if you want to do that, could you give a tick? And if you don't want to do that, if you would rather we just continue through with the presentation, if you would press the red cross, we'll take a straw poll and then um, decide what to do from then. Okay, the consensus um, seems to be that people would like to continue with the presentation and then uh, you can have a look at the, the uh, embryology portal yourself at a later date. And of course you can come back and ask us uh, or uh, get in touch with you if you have any questions afterwards. So okay, um, let's carry on then. So the advantages that we see with this online viewer is that uh, as uh, Rosa said, we've uploaded four of the human models, five, five of the human models, but in fact any of these 3D um, uh, models can be uploaded. So any of the OPT, for example, uh, models that uh, have been generated of, for example, mouse mutants or normal mouse development can, could also be used, or indeed any other um, 3D model that can be turned into the rules format. Now that's a, a, a oh, one of mine. Oh, somebody's asking a question. That's Heather. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. Uh, yes, Heather's asking a question in the text box. Go ahead, Heather. Okay, um, so I think everybody yeah, will um, have uh, seen that Heather's asked whether the resources are linked to a particular section. Um, that was one of the, the challenges that we found, so uh, that in fact if you link a particular, so the list of tag marks are indeed linked to a particular place. And of course, one problem is how do you find that place uh, as you're moving and scanning through the embryo? So that's why we set it up that we had um, predetermined orientations. And we've loaded our, our um, uh, annotations linked to those predetermined annotations, uh, predetermined orientations. Um, one of the future developments, and that's something that um, somebody is interested, it would be Greg and, and uh, Jano that would. Uh, Ah, uh, um, Greg and Yano could answer is that we would like to um, uh, have a way of you knowing whether there was an annotation nearby so that as you were scanning, if you were looking in a particular place, um, you could uh, almost uh, scan out to see whether there were any annotations nearby. Um, but that's a feature that hasn't been uh, um, implemented as yet. Uh, okay, yes. Um, the other thing that we found was, of course, uh, often what you have when you're, you're, you're teaching or often what you, you're interested in is what happens across a range of developmental stages so that we wanted to have an overview, say, of a particular organ or a particular process. And so we have we've set up annotations that are not linked to any particular place in the model but just appear as little um, tags sitting outside the model and that lets you know that there's an overview slide. Okay, so one of the participants have, has, uh, so John has lost the audio. Um, so could we just wait for a, a couple of minutes and just see whether he's until he catches up. Uh, uh, Richard, did you want to, to say something? Sorry, I'll stop speaking and uh, Richard, if you want to say something. Okay, um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll type it into the chat box so that John can see the answer as well. It's just to do with the, oh, okay, all good. 
Okay, now all I wanted to say with respect to the nearby um, resources is we have extended the server so that the client, if it wants to, as in the viewer that the people see, can uh, detect if there's a resource near to the given slide uh, and can display it. So in fact, if we, had <coughs> if we were able to extend the prototype, it would be quite easy to show nearby resources from any given plane. Uh, over. Thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on, so as you can see, this, these slides simply summarize the, the points that Rosa made as she went through how to use the viewer um, for if people want to remind themselves later. And also there is a link to a screencast where Rosa has gone through all of the um, different uh, areas on the on the viewer and how to navigate through it. Uh, again, if people want to remind themselves later. That was included on the, um, the email I sent with the links to this webinar. It was in the instruction uh, document, so they're all listed on there. Um, these uh, so next thinking about how you might use the viewer in your teaching, in teaching, and for example, uh, and the advantages of it in the sense of having something that is interactive as you're teaching, and also would be interactive as students um, uh, will try will try to learn things afterwards, and so the linking specific things to particular places. Uh, try which students could find if they understood where they to look, for example, or um, uh, incorporating quizzes and assessments uh, as a way of again checking students checking their own understanding and uh, uh, potentially assessing part of courses. Um, now, as I mentioned, the challenges as we were as, as generating these or, or linking different um, resources. What we did was we um, people within the Institute of Human Genetics generously donated their teaching slides uh, for particular courses. So an MSc course um, that we run with the developmental genetics module and the teachers on that uh, um, donated their slides and Heather also donated um, a number of PowerPoint presentations uh, and we looked at how you might then take these slides and link them to particular places. Uh, and the challenges that we found, for example, this kind of, of a slide, which has a number of statements, uh, but no um, sources, so no references, no, no evidence that, is, that would allow a student to go and find out um, whether these were accurate statements or not. So they're, they're uh, statements of apparent fact. Uh, but nothing to take the student further. The other kind of um, slide that you always found in, in um, many of the presentations were something like this, where here is the reference, so there is a way that the student could go uh, back to the original article and see the images in context, but um, he, the time information is very non-specific, so here is simply early stage and late stage. It would be very difficult to link this this information only to a particular time and place within the embryo. And then the other kind of diagram, very useful, um, is this kind of diagram. So here again, there is a reference, but there's no information about where this, uh, um, where these processes might be happening uh, in place. And time, as you can see, is simply a line with, with no references. And indeed, in, often in a diagram like this, there's no indication of what the species is either. Uh, so there's a. It, I think it's quite. Um, uh, it's not straightforward to link standard teaching materials to the three-dimensional models. But in doing that, actually, we felt that we threw up a lot of interesting questions, um, and uh, that that of itself was helpful. So I'm going to introduce another. Uh, of these blank slides and see how this works. Because having had the briefest of overviews of the resource and thinking through the kinds of things that we've talked about so far, can you see that you might have 
a use for the resource in your teaching and how do you think it might help you? So I'm going to hand over to either people to speak, in which case if you raise your hand and feel free to, to um, speak at this point or to type into the chat box or to type onto the, the whiteboard. So any thoughts? Yes, I, I think we've only shown, so if everybody's seen Richard's uh, uh, comment on the whiteboard, we've just touched very briefly on the kinds of resources that uh, um, you could link to the 3D models, but in principle it's anything that you could um, identify as being coming from a particular place in time or indeed anything that you think is relevant to uh, embryology. Now Deborah is now um, typing within the chat box. Yes, so I'm mentioning the virtual human dissector software for anatomy teacher teaching. I think the 3D model, yes, has a just a straightforward use in terms of um, getting students, uh, giving students a way of exploring the three-dimensional space which is the embryo and exploring that space at um, different stages and comparing. Um, Um, yes, the, so in terms of linking in time sensitive material, I think the, having a model where people had um, and were using the, the, uh, the portals as a, for their own private um, uh, repository and then had a, a, a way of uploading or sharing their private um, teaching resources or whatever at a particular time or pri their own private research materials indeed if you were thinking about um, uh, genome databases but also thinking again time sensitive you could have answers yes um, so yes private research materials yes but also if you were thinking about um, uh, time sensitive in the sense of having questions and then and post exams, you then could upload all the answers into the uh, or make the answer, answers visible within the models. And it just just to there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if everybody's happy that we've kind of explored some of the possibilities and some of the thoughts about how you might um, uh, use the repository and the, um, the 
the models, the, the, the portal side of things, then maybe we could move on to the next uh, I'll move on to the next slide. Could you take our cross and so take if you're happy for me to move on or if anybody else has any other questions? Okay, that's fine. Everybody's happy. Uh, we haven't had any boos or uh, <laughs> applause yet, so I take it that's uh, general happiness. Um, oh, thank you, Richard. Yes, <laughs> we've had a boo from Richard. Yeah. Okay, so next development. So we've had a bit uh, of a discussion um, of that in the sense of, of uh, how making um, uh, the cloud of other resources visible, um, also the other kinds, so the cloud of annotations rather visible from any particular section. Um, I think actually maybe at this point I might hand over to Richard to talk a little, just a little bit about that, about the server side of things. So, a bit because I've talked about a portal and the repository, but it might not be clear what what's underlying the portal. Uh, thank you, Susan, for that. <laughs> um, so I'm not quite sure what you want me to say, but the the way the system works is that the three-dimensional models and the three-dimensional images are stored on a server. And it's rather like the Google Maps server in the sense that you can access that data from anywhere uh, on the planet, and it's a, it's a completely open access. Then the client, of course, will pull from the server the information it needs, which will be a given section, or it may be a particular view, or it could even be multiple sections if you had set up a viewer that could look at multiple sections simultaneously. But the, the key thing is that the data that people capture uh, and keep uh, in their repository, uh, which is linking their data to the atlas, uh, is capturing the three-dimensional coordinates um, and, the three di and the parameters of the view um, that was used to establish um, the section that they're looking at. And that means, therefore, that people who have built up their own repositories with their own references can, in principle, share those repositories, uh, and people can, can ask, you know, who else has done some annotations near here, and so on. So they're the sorts of future developments in terms of the social aspect, if you like, uh, of the teaching materials, allowing people to perhaps quiz or, or query other people's databases. Um, then in terms of the server itself, we are using the server for delivering Atlas materials, but also um, detailed uh, spatial patterns or temporal patterns associated with the mouse, and these typically are gene expression data. Um, but of course, they don't have to be. They can be any um, uh, spatially organized material. For example, you may have um, established a delineation of the nerve fibers, the nerve tracts in the brain, or perhaps the um, arterial tree or, or um, the cardiovascular system, and so on. And that, too, you could then present through the same process. And if it's a full reconstruction uh, in terms of the atlas, then you would extend the server to deliver that material. Or if it's partial reconstruction, you'd, you'd include it with your own repository. But again, because you're using the same spatial reference framework, of course, that can be shared uh, amongst different places. So you could imagine, perhaps, uh, pulling material from somewhere else to uh, augment your own courses. And that would be the ideal in many ways. Um, lastly, the, what we can do with the server is not just show overlay material where you might have drawn something, but you can actually show uh, full images overlaid on top of each other. So for example, if you had an MR image and a CT image, you could show them blended together and then you could switch to one and switch to the other. And all these are, are, are possible um, views from the server which could be built into a client if that proved to be useful. So perhaps you could, uh, you could imagine part of a radiology course where you're trying to teach people the difference between different types of um, imaging platforms uh, and so on. Uh, and the very last thing I would mention is we are extending the server to be able to deliver uh, views from four-dimensional data. Uh, so if you do have a full four-dimensional data set, um, we can cut sections through that and show you either 
two views in space, or you could show one view in space versus one view in time, and so on. So there is a flexibility there that is opened up um, by this process. I think that's probably enough from me now, so I'll, I'll hand back to you, Susan. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that's more or less what we wanted to say here. Uh, so the remaining slides have the link to the embryo viewer, which you've engulfed in uh, emails and, and user instructions, etc. But here it is within the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and also a link to survey. So once you have had a chance to look, use the viewer and um, maybe think a little bit about the kinds of questions that um, were asked in the discussion that we had, it would be really very helpful if you could um, complete the survey. Some of you have complete, completed it already, and that's great, thank you. Uh, but for those of you who haven't, that would be very helpful. There's also a uh, discussion forum on the Hudson website as well. So if you are trying out the viewer at a later date and have any comments or questions that aren't necessarily related to the survey, feel free to, to join in on that. OK, Richard. I thought uh, one thing might be worth adding is that anybody um, you know, wants to pass on uh, th these links and, and try and draw other people in who you think might be interested, then you know please do so and and or, or put it you know in contact directly because really we want to capture as many people as possible who may be interested in this type uh, of uh, facility or, or technology. Go ahead, Heather. Yes, I, I think um, I think that was the yeah. The, I think the mouse data could be linked directly to the. There are mouse models of the different stages, and I think that's one um, kind of future development would be to uh, be able to move from say human models to the mouse models, and to uh, but to the, it would take you. You would be taken to the corresponding um, uh, places or or data. Um, that, that was related. So yes, we would definitely want to uh, link data together, um, and uh, uh, we could do that via uh, the gene expression databases as well. If it is gene expression data that you're thinking of, um, but also via the um, models directly. Do you want to ask a question? I think that's it. John just asked a question in the tech box. I think that's an, uh, uh, that's one for Richard. So I'll hand over. I'll hand over. Okay. Um, so John, uh, there is um, of course uh, a limit uh, which we haven't yet reached. We have tested the server for up to 64 simultaneous users, and by simultaneous, I mean um, actually uh, 64. Uh, computers bashing the system at the same time. And you do begin to detect a slowdown at about uh, 40. And, but that was a rather unrealistic test in the sense you almost never get someone, you never, almost never get um, uh, 60 people clicking the button you know, precisely at the same time. So in terms, can we cope? Then ultimately, I hope we can't, because then we'll just have to switch to the the type of um, processing that Google does, where actually they'll have switching according to country, or they may even have additional servers running uh, to make things work. And then finally, if need be, we can replicate the server. It's all open source, and it will run on a standard web server for most of the 3D models that we have. Uh, and so if it really became a problem, then you could have your own server running locally and wouldn't depend on things coming around the planet. But provided you're using the same models, of course, the data uh, can be used um, uh, and, and can be remapped and fused with anybody else's system. Sorry, that, that, that's all. Okay. Um, 
I think we're on to the, 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 the last bit, which is, are there any other questions that people have uh, at the moment? As I say, we've, we've said that there are various ways uh, that people can uh, get in touch or, or ask other questions uh, directly later. And then we will give, send you a link to uh, the recording of the session afterwards and um, when it's sorted out and send you email that link to you. So I think really on behalf of um, Yano and Greg and uh, Richard and Rosa and myself, we really want to say a big thank you uh, to everybody who um, came to the session and participated. So does anybody have any other questions? Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, that's very nice of you. <laughs> Um, so we're having some applause, yes. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I think we would say um, goodbye. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs>